Our text for this morning is John chapter 11, from verse 38 to verse 44. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odour, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you will always hear me, but I said, these, said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. The raising of Lazarus from the grave is Jesus' greatest miracle before his own resurrection. As here, Jesus defeats not just sickness, but death itself. There are other recorded cases in the, in the Gospel accounts where Jesus raised the dead, and we can only speculate as to how many others are not recorded. But what makes the raising of Lazarus unique is that Jesus didn't raise someone who had just died, but a man who had been lying in the grave for four days and whose body was beginning to decompose. And the raising of Lazarus brings to a close the, the first half of John's Gospel. The first 11 chapters focus on the seven miracles, which are signs of Jesus' deity. And as we look back on these seven signs, we can see a pattern developing, as each of these signs builds on the previous ones. And the significance of each one grows until we come to the raising of Lazarus. The first miracle in the Gospel of John is the turning of water into wine in, in chapter 2. And here Jesus is revealed to be the true source of joy and abundant life. The second miracle is the healing of the son of a nobleman in chapter 4. And this sign shows us that Jesus has power over human sickness and, and consequently over the sickness of, of, the, of the spirit caused by sin. The third miracle is the healing of the lame man at the Pool of Bethesda in chapter 5. This man represents the helpless spiritual state that we all suffer with as a result of sin. Then the fourth and the fifth signs are both in chapter 6, where Jesus, as the bread of life, feeds the large crowd, not only physically, but also brings spiritual nourishment to the lost, after which he walks on the water, which points to his power over nature. And then the sixth miracle, which Jesus, which is recorded in John's Gospel, is in chapter 9, where he gives sight to the man who was born blind. And the significance of this sign is that sinners are born spiritually blind. And we are in spiritual darkness. It is only God, through Christ, who can give us spiritual, insight, spiritual eyesight. John then tells us in chapters 20 and 21 that there were many other signs performed by Jesus. But inspired by the Spirit, John records only seven of them for the purpose of pointing the lost to Jesus for salvation. Because each miracle, as wonderful as they were for those who benefit, benefited from them directly, each of them has a deeper spiritual significance for us all. In other words, we may not have been there. We might not have been given a physical meal. We might not have had our physical blindness healed. But we are all beneficiaries of the ultimate miracle of salvation when we turn to Christ in repentance and faith. And the climax in John's Gospel of the signs he recorded is the raising of Lazarus in chapter 11. And the deeper lesson behind this miracle is obvious. We are dead in our sins, but Jesus raises us to spiritual life. And as we've seen over the last couple of weeks, Lazarus became ill and his sisters Martha and Mary called for Jesus but when he finally arrived, Lazarus had already died. And verse 11 tells us that Jesus wept at the tomb, revealing how God in his humanity identifies with, with, with his people as he shares in our sorrow. And we pick up the account today in verse 38, where we're told that Jesus was deeply moved again. And here again we see that he enters into our sorrow. He, he feels the pain of human suffering. But then he immediately says in verse 39, take away the stone. And there's a marked and there's a sudden and a deliberate change in the text here. The Dutch theologian Herman Ridderbos wrote this. 
He says, enough now of tears and wailing. Enough honor has been bestowed on death. Against the power of death, God's glory will now enter the arena. In the previous verses, we are given an insight into the humanity of Jesus. But being fully God at the same time, he now takes full control of the situation. Martha says says something quite interesting, in, quite interesting in verse 39. She says, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Now some commentators have been rather critical of Martha's comment here, saying that she was showing a lack of faith, especially when we look at her words in verse 27, which she had spoken only minutes earlier, where she said, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. So now it might seem that there is some kind of change here in Martha's faith, but we must remember the circumstances. Lazarus had been dead for four days, and his body would have started to decompose by now. She still had no idea what Jesus was about to do. And as far as Martha was concerned, she believed that Lazarus would be raised on the last day. She had already said so in verse 24. But she was horrified at the thought of having the stone over Lazarus's tomb removed. I mean, after all, what was she expecting Jesus to do? To walk into this cave which served as a tomb and go and see the body of Lazarus? Exposing yourself to a dead body in Jewish culture was strictly forbidden. Not only was there, was there a risk of infection, but there were spiritual implications too. Numbers 19.11 says, Whoever touches the dead body of any person shall be unclean seven days. And when Martha objected to the stone being removed, this was Jesus' reply to her in verse 40. Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? There are many who believe that Jesus' answer to her was not so much a rebuke as it was an opportunity to teach Martha and everybody else who was there a valuable lesson in faith. Because whenever Jesus performed a miracle, one of the many purposes of that miracle was that his disciples' faith would be strengthened. In Matthew 8, he was asleep in their fishing boat. When a storm came up, it threatened to, to sink them. And just before Jesus calmed the storm, he said in verse 26, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? And as we've already seen, he said to his disciples as they were on their way to Bethany to raise Lazarus, he said to them, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I'm glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. In verse 25, he said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. So if you take all of these accounts and you kind of join the dots, his words in verse 40 make a lot more sense. Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Martha and those with her were about to be given the privilege of seeing just the tiniest glimpse of the power and the glory of God. Now there would be no doubt that this was the Christ the Son of God who is coming into the world. There's an old saying that seeing is believing. But the lesson that Jesus taught Martha was that if she believes, then she will see. It's in our nature. Prove something to be true, then I'll believe it. But the Christian faith challenges that old theory of seeing as believing. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. It's really hard to define faith, but the faith to believe that Jesus is who he says he is, is a gift which God gives to us. The gospel message stands directly opposed to rational human thinking and understanding, which is exactly why we need God-given faith to believe in the first place. Otherwise, we would never believe. But as we grow in grace and our understanding of the mysteries of God and his ways, we begin to learn to take him at his word. When we believe God, when we do take him at his word, then we will see, then we will receive our salvation. Jesus calls for faith first and then sight later. And like Martha, we are challenged to believe and see the glory of God. And as we continue, then we see that Jesus' words were enough for Martha. She believed, and the stone was removed. So now, having, having given the lesson in faith, Jesus then gives his onlookers an example of faith. We're told that he lifted up his eyes as he prayed. This, this is a, the typical posture of when, when praying in those times. 
But Martha was looking down at the difficulties. All she could see was the grave of her brother. It is when we need God the most that our faith needs to be at its strongest. Because in our circumstances, especially during our times of struggle, by God's grace, he will make us aware of his power and his presence, just as Jesus did for Martha and Mary in John chapter 11. The first two verses of Psalm 121 says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. God is the creator of the universe and nothing is beyond his power. When we look up in faith to him, we see the power which made all things. Zephaniah 3 verse 17 says, The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. And then Jesus' prayer in verses 41 and 42. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But then he continues, But I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. If you look at that prayer carefully, you'll see it's not a prayer of petition. It's not a request. It was a prayer of thanksgiving to the Father. It was the Father's will that Lazarus would be raised from the dead. So Jesus' prayer in those two verses were actually not for his benefit, but for those who were there. Jesus gave life to Lazarus, to Lazarus so that those who witnessed this miracle would recognize Jesus as the Son of God and would then believe in him. This seventh sign, the high point of the Gospel of John so far, is all about the glory of God. Jesus prayed audibly to let the people know what he was about to do would bring glory to his Father. He voiced his prayer for the benefit of those who were there. What else can we learn from this particular miracle? If anything should strengthen our faith in God, it is Jesus' raising of Lazarus from the grave, and of course his own resurrection too. Although the curse of death is inevitable in our fallen world, those who put their faith and their trust in Christ will find that the Lord is faithful to deliver us. Not from the presence of trials and suffering, or even from death itself, but he will deliver us from the power of evil, the power of death, and the power of sin. During these dark days that we're living in, God is faithful to his people, and he has promised us the power and the perseverance that we need to endure every trial of life. We are the ones who have had our eyes open to the spiritual truth of, of who Jesus really is, which means that we have a responsibility to be faithful witnesses to the gospel message. And the world is watching us. Jesus prayed aloud then not to draw attention to himself, but to point to God. And he wanted all who were there to hear. And there were many who were there that day. He wanted them to believe that it was God who had sent him, and it was God who was at work in him. And our faith should have a similar effect by encouraging others to seek their own relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Because it always has been and it always will be about him and not about us. The, the dramatic events at Lazarus' grave teach us so much about faith. But its primary purpose is to reveal Jesus not merely as an example of faith, but as the great object of our faith. We know the story of Lazarus very well, but we can only imagine what it must have been like for the people who were there. What were they thinking when Jesus walked up to the tomb, called for the stone to be removed, and then praying as boldly as he did. Because in that prayer, he made some very bold claims, declaring that God always hears him, and that God had sent him. Not all of those who were there that day were followers or disciples of Jesus, as we'll see next week when we finish chapter 11. So by saying that God always listened to him, they would have known that their unbelief was being challenged by Jesus. But before anybody could do anything or say anything, he spoke again. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. John tells us that Jesus cried in a loud voice. The reason wasn't that he needed to shout loudly. Rather, this was a demonstration of his divine authority. This was the same voice which called all of creation into being. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. 
In John 11 verse 43, that same voice called the dead back to life because even the grave cannot resist the power of the eternal God. A.W. Pink wrote in his commentary, Here was public proof that the Lord Jesus had absolute power over the material world and over the realm of spirits. At his bidding, a soul that had left its earthly tenement was called back from the unseen to dwell once more in the body. What does this teach us? Quite simply, our hope for eternal life is in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone. He is the only Savior. As we come face to face with the certainty of our own deaths, we look in faith to Him alone who has, who, who has the power to conquer even death itself. And interestingly enough, apart from a couple of references to him in the next chapter, we hear nothing more about Lazarus in the Bible. We know very little about him. We, there's, there's no quotes from Lazarus at all. We never hear about him saying anything. But I wonder what must have been going through his mind as he lay on his deathbed for the second time. I'm sure, like us all, he must have been apprehensive at least at the prospect of dying. But having been through the events recorded in John 11, how did he feel? knowing from personal experience that Jesus really is the resurrection and the life. We know the same truth about Jesus. Not that we've returned from the dead, but because of the witness of God's word and the historical record that we have that Jesus himself walked out of his own tomb. Just think about it. For all of our intelligence and all of our technology, we know absolutely nothing about the process of death. What does it actually feel like? What will it be like? We know very little about it, which is one of many reasons for death to be our greatest enemy. But what we do know is this. Because of Christ, we can face our own deaths with confidence because he has conquered the grave and he has promised everlasting life in glory with him to those who believe in him. The raising of, of Lazarus back to life also gives us a wonderful illustration of conversion and salvation. John emphasizes that Jesus called to Lazarus and then by the word of Christ, a dead man was given life. It's by responding to the gospel call, the gospel message, the call of Jesus Christ that we are saved. As, as Jesus says in John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. In John 5, 25, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Paul writes in Ephesians 2, verse 5, that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but we are made alive in Christ. It is God who calls us to life. It is God who enables us to hear the voice of the Good Shepherd. And he gives us the power to respond to him as we follow him. The call of Jesus Christ alone has the power to raise the dead and to convert the sinner. And also, Jesus called Lazarus by name, in the same way that he calls lost sinners to saving faith by name. This is what is known as the effectual call of God, that, that mighty work by which Christ calls us personally by the gospel as he draws us with power to himself that we're then able to believe and to follow him. The Reformation Study Bible uses the raising of Lazarus to explain this important doctrine. It says, when God called the world into being, the universe did not hesitate to comply with the command. God's desired effect in creation came to pass. Likewise, when Jesus called the dead Lazarus from his grave, Lazarus responded with life. There is also an effectual call of God in the life of the believer. It is a call that brings about its desired effect. Effectual calling is related to the power of God in regenerating the sinner from spiritual death. It is sometimes referred to as irresistible grace. Effectual calling refers to a call of God that by his sovereign power and authority brings about his desired and ordained effect or result. When Paul teaches that those whom he predestines he calls and those whom he calls he justifies, the call to which he is referring is the effectual call of God. Because we are born dead in our trespasses and sins, we are helpless. And there is nothing that we can do to save ourselves. 
But Jesus comes and he calls us by name from death to life. And it is only he who can save. Before coming to Christ, we are spiritually dead. We don't care about God. We have no interest in acknowledging him or worshipping him. That is the state of the non-believing heart. But when the call of the good shepherd is heard and responded to, we are then raised to spiritual life. And from Ephesians chapter 2 again, verses 4 and 5. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our, trans- in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. This is the, the, the spiritual rebirth that Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about back in chapter 3. Because it is then when true change is seen in our lives, as by the Spirit we are given a hunger and a thirst for God's truth. We are drawn together in Christian fellowship as we worship together, because we are family, we belong together. We are given a a, a new desire for the things of God as a result of our spiritual resurrection. Look at what Jesus said to Lazarus. Look what he said when Lazarus came out of the tomb. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. When, When we are raised to this new life in Christ, why would we want to go around still wearing the grave clothes of our previous lives of rebellion against God. If we really want to experience the abundant life that Jesus offers us, we need to, with God's help, we need to leave those old lives behind by exchanging these clothes of death for garments of holiness. You remember when when Jesus began his public ministry in Luke chapter 4, Jesus quoted the first verse and a half of Isaiah 61. We're very familiar with these words. But look at the first three verses of Isaiah 61 with the story of Lazarus fresh in your minds. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captors and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Look at those words through the lens of the story of the raising of Lazarus, and they're taken a whole new meaning. Paul reminds us in Ephesians 4, from verse 22, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires. To be renewed in the spirit of your minds, to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Why do we need to live our lives in true righteousness and holiness? Because there is a great day coming when Jesus will return for his own. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a a cry of command and the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise. That is the promise of the returning Christ. The the account of, of the raising of Lazarus ends with a final yet an important detail. As Jesus said to those who were there, unbind him and let him go. This is an illustration of the work and the witness of the church. In verse 39, he had told them to remove the stone, and now he tells them to remove Lazarus' grave clothes. This teaches us that there's work to be done. Now it is God who saves. He is the one with the power to bring the dead back to life. But his church is the chosen instrument to take the gospel message to the lost. James Boyce wrote this in his commentary. We cannot bring the dead back to life, but we can bring the word of Christ to them. We can do preparatory work, and we can do work afterward. We can help remove stones, stones of ignorance, error, prejudice, and despair. After the miracle, we can help the new Christian by unwinding the grave clothes of doubt, fear, introspection, and discouragement. And A.W. Pink says, There is no higher privilege this side of heaven than for us to be used of the Lord in rolling away gravestones 
and removing grave clothes. Have you been saved by the grace of God? Have you responded to Jesus' call of a new life of holiness? Or are you still bound and trapped in the grave clothes of your rebellion against God? Not only does Jesus call you to be saved, but he calls you to a whole new life. But you have to respond personally to his call. If you have not repented of your sins and turned to Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, you remain spiritually dead. Hear Christ calling to you and accept his gracious offer and be saved. And he will raise you to resurrection life for all of eternity. Shall we pray? Father, we are so familiar with the story of Lazarus. But in reality, it is the story of what you have done for all of those whom you call to salvation. Thank you that even though we are spiritually dead, even though we are born in rebellion against you, thank you that you sent your son to be our atoning sacrifice. Thank you for the cross of Christ and the blood shed there for us. And as, Lord Jesus, you called Lazarus from his grave, so too you call us from spiritual death into spiritual life. What an amazing thing you've done for us, Lord. And we give you thanks that you've regenerated us, that you've given us a new life, a new hope and a new purpose. And the promise is eternity with you. And this is all and only because of the glory of God. And so we worship you and we give you thanks, Lord. Amen.